So I was going to proceed with this afternoon session. And my dear husband said, I want you to finish what you didn't finish this morning on the Sabbath school. So I submit myself to him. <laughs> so, so let me open up this morning's slide. Just a few slides that we didn't get to do. Should, should I do that? So we rushed about what is love for man, and maybe my husband wasn't so happy that I didn't finish everything. I think we did this one, but I can re reiterate a little bit for him to be happy. <laughs> Very important, I keep him happy. There we go. So I talked about what is number one need, what men need to have from women. It's not cooking. It's not keeping the house clean. It's not raising our kids right. The number one need is the, our willingness and happy attitude towards sexual uh, enjoyment connection. So that's what's number one need for a guy. So maybe I said that one more time. Does that make you happy now? <laughs> <laughs> so when I learned this, I'm telling you, I was guilty of saying every night is not tonight, right? Too tired. Oh, not tonight again. Every night was like that for our first several years of our marriage, right? So when I learned about all of this, I went home. I said, honey, you sit over here. So I had him sit down on the sofa, and I knelt to him, and I said, I am so sorry. I didn't know anything about this. Every night was not tonight. I don't know how he managed. But he said it was very, very difficult. So I said, from now on, I will not make you starve on this thing. I will do my best keep my body healthy, and keep my emotion healthy, which you need to help me with, and so that I will not refuse you when you need to have this important project. He was so happy. I mean, his whole face beamed. Look at him. Just talking about it. He's so beaming. He said, are you sure about that? I said, I am sure that I'm going to do my best so I don't refuse you when you ask me. So I, not only I try not to refuse him, but I try to do it first, right? I said, what's the matter? It's about time for you to do it. Why are you not sending me any signal? And he just gets so beaming all over his face, and he gets so happy. So we try to do this, and I tried what I learned that I think what he needs, I try to give him. And he tried so hard to work with my issues of my anger issue, my own scar, emotional hurt issues. So we try really, really hard. So if you are Korean, there's one Korean person that I recognize, you have to get rid of this cultural thing that to be a wise wife, that you need to keep clean the house and be a good cook and, you know, raise the kids right. And we all raise the kids right anyways. Don't even worry about that, right? So then the, the Korean women, we get too tired to do anything extra. So forget about keeping house clean if this is the night that your husband is going to ask you to have a good bonding time. And forget about cooking good if you're too tired about that. Because men voted for bringing the food to have a good uh, sexual bonding time, right? So remember, woman, that's what guys need. Okay. So then we got into the emotional bonding, and we talked about that. Because I was skipping so fast, and he wanted me to go over. So vision style, we did do this, right? The guys see 45... Uh, the uh, 45 degree angle that we see 180, 
degree angle. So when we drive, uh, the pastor uh, told me that on, when I was talking about this, that he, he immediately thought about driving. When you guys drive with a woman of your love, you just have to know that we get startled by every little passing by car. Because we don't have to look around. We, we're looking ahead, but we see everything coming from left side and the right side. We feel like everything passing by is going to hit us. So, so, oh, watch that. Watch that. And you guys don't mind. You just keep going. What's the matter? Nobody's going to hit us. And you don't know until somebody actually hit you. So that kind of thing can also happen. And, but also, the advantage of that is the guys, because they're tunnel vision, but they also see far away. So they don't usually miss the exit sign. <laughs> we see the exit sign when it comes right in front of us. Oh, 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 I missed it, you know. So that also happens. So when there's a traffic jam, men see that first. And we don't see until we get jammed that we get right in front of there, right? So there's also all of these differences that we just, some of these things we cannot change. And some of these things, the why the men look at all the beautiful women, we cannot change. We just have to go to heaven and ask Jesus, why did you do this? <laughs> but I do know one thing, when God made a man and looked at, him, looked at the Adam, he said, oh, oh, there are too many missing buttons here. Right, it was not good for men to be alone, right? Their mind was not very inclusive in and everything. So he made a woman, and then the woman, I think he did extra work there. So he became a little more anal in and everything. So, you know, we do have to deal with all of these things. So, you know, men, when your women try to tell you what to do, what not to do, and you go to the church and we, we don't have to look around, we already know who don't like us, Right? We don't have to look at like this. We can scan everybody. Oh, she's upset with me. Men, they have clue. They have no clue. It's just clueless, walking around, and then everything's okay unless somebody comes and punch them. Then they know. So if your wife tells you, oh, I think this, this person is upset with us, we better make some kind of talk, trust your wife. And then just make some time and connect with that person and talk. Because women have a lot of six senses. Guys, you have zero six senses. So trust your wife when she talks about something that you guys need to do. So all of these things come with a vision style and a lack of emotional communication brain cells. Okay? Mm -hmm. Benefits of happy marriage. Now, by now, how does happy marriage happen? For a woman, what is happy marriage? Emotional bonding. And what is love for women? Good communication and talking. And a little bit of help with the house chores and this and this and this. So what is the love for the guys thing? Having good sex without feeling guilty. No starvation. Second, a lot of compliments. And a third, that you're staying beautiful. So, you know, you have to take care of yourself. Find the right hairstyle for you and find the color that your husband likes and try to buy a lot of clothing in that. Don't try to save time in doing your hair thing, right? $10 saving here and there, $20 saving here and there. They don't appreciate that. Of course, when you're starving, that your salary is only $1,000 a month, they will appreciate. But once the level is certain, that you can live in a two, three bedroom houses or apartment and that you don't have to worry about starving every day, that you have enough food to buy things for the kids and this and that. And then you don't want to get into saving a little bit over here and there. You want to get into taking care of yourself. You know, beautiful hairstyle for you, beautiful dress. And when somebody, you know, when your husband says, let's go out shopping, don't go to only Ross's or the trip to store, or Goodwill. If he's offer you to buy some good clothing, go to somewhere that he would like to see you going. I don't know a store. No, it could be Nordstrom, it could be Ann Taylor, or some other stores, right? So don't you know, make him feel that he's doing something good for you. And of course, whatever present he gives to you, you don't want to say, why is this? 
Anything that he gets, you want to say, oh, wonderful. Even if you have to go back and exchange it later by yourself. <laughs> you just have to say, oh, I love it. Because he won't always remember what he got for you. So if he got you the green blouse and you want to change to red blouse, you can just change. And I say, oh, didn't I get you a green one? Yeah, it, it got turned into red and it's more beautiful and they don't mind. So the, but when he first gives something to you, you guys always have to say, wonderful. And the flowers, so beautiful. I didn't know how to do this before, right? When he got me flowers and I thought, why? Why spend money on flowers? And then after a few years of this, he never gave me any flowers. Now I have to beg for flowers. Honey, I love flowers now, right? <laughs> so then he will remember. Remember I told you I didn't used to like flowers because of my mom's reaction to the flower bed that we made? So things like that. So the happy marriage. When we talk about happy marriage, for guys having good sex, and even for women having good sex and have a good communication, it does boost our immune to 20%. So you're less likely to catch cold, flus, and then that kind of thing. And for male, especially, the heart, the heart attack decreased to how much? 50%. So make sure if you don't want your husband to have a heart attack, you don't ever refuse him. Okay? So remember that one. And then also, decreased anxiety. And it works with the oxytocin. Oxytocin is a very comfort uh, chemical. It makes you trust everybody. It makes you relax because you trust. So a lot of salespeople nowadays, they try to use oxytocin spray when they do the speech because they, they make you feel trusting. The oxytocin is the same uh, chemical that when women have a baby, they give you pitocin drip for it to contract the uterus to push out the baby faster. The pitocin is the same thing as oxytocin. So after you have a baby, you feed the breastfeed the baby, and when you breastfeed the baby, you just feel like this thing is so precious that even if I put this baby in my eyes, my eyes wouldn't hurt. That's the kind of closeness that we feel. That's the oxytocin, but it also makes us trust our spouses. That's why when one person betrays, you just get so hurt, so damaging if you have an affair because that oxytocin flow makes us to trust each other. And it also washes out all the stress hormones. It keeps us very, very healthy. And it also makes us to sleep good because of the oxytocin and all the anxiety and then everything goes away. And the more sleep that you have, so it's very, very healthy for women too. And a men's prostate cancer, one-third decrease. So try that. Okay. So oxytocin level surge alleviates a lot of physical pains. So if you don't have a happy marriage, you get a lot of physical pains. One day your ankle hurts, and next day the knee hurts, and next day your shoulder hurts, next day your abdomen hurts, and everywhere. Because the oxytocin, when it comes out, brings endorphin together. Endorphin is the uh, painkiller. So it works together for us not to feel a lot of little pains. And in living in California, with all of this air pollution and everything, unless you stay happy, and stay happily married, you are about to have a lot of physical pains. They were so polluted with all these bad airs. So, you know, you try to stay healthy by having happy marriage. A lot of endorphin comes out. It alleviates a lot of physical little pains that uh, the medically cannot be explained. Okay? And a migraine headache. So, in America, there's good sex, there's no headache. Right? So there is truth to that, and less depression, of course. I have not seen too many depressed clients when they're happily married. There's something about happily married that prevents a person to go into depression. Of course, women, we do look younger. Because when oxytocin comes, the growth hormone DHEA also comes together. So if I am 67, 
and looks this young, there must be some contribution coming from what I'm emphasizing about, right? <laughs> and then also, and then if you are into exercising, having, you know, having had uh, the sexual activity does cost some physical calorie. So you can do a lot of exercise, you know, the 30-minute uh, walking, running, calories, and all this can get into having like a 15 to 20 minutes of a good uh, sexual time. Lasting marriage equates to happiness generated by an extra $100,000. Counting all the pains that you don't have to have, that you don't have to go medical doctors, and then all of this, and then some guy said, okay, then I won't go work. I'll just have a sex all day long. It doesn't work that way. You still have to go work and bring some money for wife to feel safe that she can do this for you, right? So, you know, work and woman stay healthy, have a good communication, having very loving uh, sexual interaction, and that keeps you happy. That leads to more loving and more effective ministry to the people. Correct? Yeah. So if your husband happened to have a lot of argument with all the board members and very upset about pastor for too long, try to give him very, very loving interaction. Maybe the oxytocin will bring endorphin together and relaxes him. Maybe he will be happier. So when he's happy and happily satisfied, maybe he will become less obsessive about things. So a lot of different things that we women are so responsible for men's happiness. Ooh, men didn't say amen about that one. I'm going to skip really fast. <laughs> okay, so that's the part that I kind of skipped this morning when I was talking about men and women. So there are a lot more about men and women. Gary Smalley wrote several books about the difference between men and women, right? I think he had like four or five different series, bedroom differences and something differences. So you want to get some of those books to read. And by now, if you don't know your spouse's love map, you will want to create that. So this afternoon when you go home, you need to ask spouse, what makes you feel loved? You have to know this. Because when you try, you don't want to try with your own way. Because you tried and tried and tried, and that wasn't what he wanted. Then you wasted so much of energy, and you feel hopeless and helpless. So when you want to try something, do it effectively by asking what makes you feel loved, what makes him feel loved. And just give that, whatever that may give. This is a general information how guy feel loved and woman feel loved about. But there is individual idiosyncratic ways how your spouse feel loved by. So you want to create a map. So you're going to create three maps. One for love map, asking your spouse what makes him or her feel loved about. So you want to feel another map that was what makes him or her feel upset. So you know what triggers his emotional uh, pains, right? So then you know how to avoid. The other one is, how do I make you comforted again? What can I do to make you feel less upset, less hurtful? So you want to know all of this about your spouse. If you don't know by now, you need to do it. Okay, now let's go into communication. Are you happy? Okay, he's happy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all of the knowledge and theories you learn can only be translated into talking because all the hurt that we receive comes from what? From how we talk to each other. So talking is a crucial in happy marriage. And you cannot talk the, the same way that you talk with other people. You cannot talk in the same way that you talk with the coworkers. There is a specific way the couple need to learn to talk to make each other feel loved, okay? So when we talk about talking, 
we really need to know why do we see the way that we see. My husband would say one thing, and I will interpret, oh, you mean you didn't like me? He said, no, that's not what I said. But yes, you did. That's what you just said. So why do we hear what we hear? And why do we hear the way that we interpret? So where does this interpretation thing comes from? Right? So this is a very important. And then all of the interpretational thing comes from, again, our parental, our childhood experiences. And as we, you know, live through our childhood, you know, we make image of our parents. My mom's image, my dad's image, all gets to be internalized. And the same thing, in your case, by the time they become about seven, your image is in their frontal lobe brain right here, and your image is also in their frontal lobe brain right here. So if the kids are loved and protected and understood and forgiven and comforted, they know, oh, my mom is so loving and so forgiving. She's very comforting to me. And they have that image in their brain already. But if they are, if the parents are very abusive and forceful and rejecting and abandoning all of that, that image also gets to be internalized in the brain. And for a long time, we didn't know where in the brain the parental images are internalized. And now we know it is right there, where, right here where the picture is, the dorsal frontal lobe. The frontal lobe right above, right here. So my image was also internalized to my kids. And my husband's image was internalized to my kids as well. So they all had that image of us. And when that image is already formulated, we call that schema in psychological terms. Schema is a pattern, like I'm wearing this green jacket here. For me to wear this, if a designer has to make this pattern, and the sewing person will sew, and it comes to the store. We call this pattern, and this emotional pattern is called schema in psychological terms. So by this schema that already established in the brain, we act. Because that, that schema becomes a permanent sunglasses. Whatever the color that you put on becomes fixated on your eye. So if your mother was loving and comforting and this, we see a lot of those loving behaviors in people. If she was harsh and neglecting, and we see a lot of those in people's behavior. So, you know, the men's schema effect and dad's schema effect, when I went to the um, elementary school, you know, I sat very front seat in the school. And that there was a guy who was a teacher, was a friend of my dad. So that I was happy. But if my father, as neglective as he was, he was never abusive physically or violently. So, but if he was a very abusive and violent way, would I be sitting at the very front row in the classroom? No. I am thinking men are dangerous. So I'll be sitting in the very back, preferably behind a little bit big person, right? So that that person, that, that, that teacher can never see me and point at me. And the same thing, when the mother was too busy, that was my problem. I love studying. I studied so many years in America after I came here. So I was always busy. So my kids always think that I am too busy for them, right? So all of these images, and in all of the images, once it's internalized, we see everybody's behavior through this internalized schema glasses. So this is why there are a lot of discrepancies in what a person is saying and in what we are hearing. Now, what person is meaning something, and then I interpret it in a different way. So it's almost like the very easy one is like if your father had an affair and therefore they had a lot of argument and this and that and finally got divorced or something and you married to another guy. He comes home 15 minutes late from his work. What are you going to be thinking, woman? He's cheating on me. It's the schema glasses. And if he tried to explain something, do you believe it? You don't believe him. 
Because you tell him, you don't even say it in a nice way because you are already upset. Thinking is an all imagination of a projection of your own schema, right? Think that he was spending some time with another woman. So you don't even say it nicely and you just say, so what was that woman? What's her name? And he goes like, what are you talking about? And you go, now don't try to lie. I know what being late means. And then I know it from the gut, so don't lie it. Then when, you, when a spouse comes like this, can you talk to her? It's impossible to talk. It's a schema projection. So, you know, we do a lot of this. When mother was too busy while you were growing up, and when your wife becomes too busy, you feel so abandoned by her. And you say, you're always too busy. You never care for me. I do care for you. I was just busy with my clients. Oh, no, I know you don't care. I know what the look is like. So that gut feeling, that gut feeling is always the projection of the emotional image that you have in your brain. So a lot of our kids, the Adventist kids, are having this neglecting issue when I do counseling, Right? So she was too busy. She doesn't care for me. We were too busy, and especially the lot of immigration family here. We were too busy surviving as a first immigration person, first generation. Sometimes we would lock the kids and I lock the door and go work and then tell them, make sure you don't open the door. So, you know, they survived, but they have this neglected issue. And then it gets projected into the family dynamic. So when we know that we are arguing about these differences between what he said and what she says, it's because one of us is projecting our own schema issue. So a lot of this is going on. And based on the schema interpretation, we will act. The way we say, the tone of voice, and all of this is determined by how I imagined my imagined interpretation is gets to play. So if I was, you know, ignored and discriminated a lot, and I'm walking by, and some guy will look at me, and I'm thinking, so what? Why are you looking at me like that? Because I'm interpreting he's discrimi discriminating me. He doesn't like me and all of this. But if I was liked by a lot, my parents and my sisters and brothers and people around me, when some people look at me, even at this age, what, what am I going to be thinking? Hmm, that's pretty good. At age 67, I have something to be looked at. And then can I be nice to him? Naturally, my interpretation was so positive and nice. So my reaction to this person is very, very sweet. So can I help you? It's, oh, no, no. I was just looking. Oh, okay. That was it, right? But it's all about our schema issue, how we interpret people's behavior. So even though we are looking at the same picture, same uh, situation somewhere here, let's say the three people are looking, all three people may be interpreting this situation very different ways. You know, one person may be, hmm, see, they purposely left me out, the feeling left out. Of course, if you had a lot of left out experiences, being left out experiences, that's how you're going to interpret but if you also have a lot of experience of people gossiping on you and you're ostracized by them, what are you going to interpret? How are you going to interpret? Oh, I know they are talking about me. And once you know that they are talking about you, not nice way usually, it's a very bad, then how are you going to react? You either run away or you go say, don't you talk about me anything bad. It better be true whatever you're talking about. No, we weren't talking about, oh, I know you were talking about me. I know what that look is like. So you know it by your own experience. Now you're projecting your own experience onto these three people who were not talking about you. But your gut feeling tells you that's what they were talking about. So when there's a discrepancy between what your spouse says and your gut feeling, who, what do you believe? Your spouse, whatever he's explaining, she's explaining to you, that's what you have to uh, trust. Don't trust your gut feeling. If you grew up in a happy family, 
most of your interpretation is going to be very naive and happy. So you can keep that gut feeling. But if you had a lot of negative experience, your gut feeling, most of the time, is very negative. So don't trust your gut feeling. You have to talk down to your gut feeling. He said he didn't mean that he didn't love me. He said he was just too busy. So it's okay that you don't have to know, you don't have to think that he doesn't love you. So you need to talk down to your gut feeling and train your gut feeling. So we do a lot of these things in the schema. So when you think about how you hear, what you hear, how you react to a situation, you, know, you need to think about your childhood. What experiences bring you the assumptions you're making on your partner's behavior, right? So get your mind ready before you talk. Be aware of the issues deep inside of you and be aware of your emotional scars. Recognize your cognitive pattern, how you interpret your spouse's behavior. Because we don't always get mad at our spouses. We get mad at our spouses based on our interpretation of a spouse's behavior. It's not the pure behavior. We don't ever see anybody in clean slate. We are already con contaminated by the schema glasses. We see everybody through the schema glasses. So, you know, you have to know your background and recognize your emotional pattern and to take a control of that automatic emotional reaction and be able to stop projecting your own I issues and be able to connect with the person right in front of you. You know, we say a lot of things. Sometimes we argue. And by the time you say, all men are the same, who are you talking about? You're not talking about your husband right at this time. You're talking about somebody way long before. And when guys said, all women are the same, you know that you have an issue with a woman being a certain way. And you're not dealing with your wife right now. You're dealing with your past experience with another woman. That could be your mom. That could be somebody else before. Right? So when you say all men or women, then you know you're projecting your schema issues. So, you know, that's how you catch yourself. Oh, okay. So when you talk with your partner, there are specific rules that I teach to all my clients. So the number one is take off your schema glasses. Meaning, do not determine your spouse's intention or emotion. In plain English, don't read their mind. Okay? So for you not to put any schema glasses on there, whatever you want to say, that you use I statement. I feel this way. So number one rule, take off schema glasses. So taking off schema glasses. This is my first grandson when he was like two or three maybe, that he was playing with this thing. It was heart-shaped. And then he somehow took apart, and he was putting on and off, on and off. I said, oh, Brandon, keep doing it. So I took pictures of him. Okay? So let's have some examples here. Let's see that your wife is looking at you up and down. And if you were despised a lot by look of up and down, going like this, your interpretation may be, what? She's despising me right now. She hates me. She despises me to her gut. So that's the interpretation. So you got your schema glasses on here, and then how are you going to be talking with the schema glasses on? Don't you look at me like that. I know you despise me all the time. And don't tell me that you don't because I know what that look is about. So if you know what that look is about, you know you're talking about your past experience. So that's what I mean by talking with the schema glasses on. So then how do you say without the schema glasses? So you just need to be open without deciding why she looked at you like that. So what would be opening communication? Okay, everybody read together. Yeah, it all depends on the tone of the voice too. 
How come you look at me like that? If there's already schema coming out, right? And you're angry the, because the way that he was looking at you. Or she, right? But the tone is very, very important. So if you do, hmm, I wonder why you're looking at me like that. It's a neutral, open communication. And he can say, you just look especially beautiful today. Oh, forget it. You don't want to do that, right? So they say, thank you. I almost made a mistake thinking that you don't like me at this moment. It's okay for you to express, but you don't decide that he was looking at you because he didn't like you that moment. So that's the open communication. That's the first rule, and this is so important in the church setting too, right? Because everybody makes all different interpretation out of their own schema glasses. So sometimes pastor can make one sermon, 100 people sitting here, all 100 people might make a different interpretation. Some people might feel he's talking down on me. I knew that he was upset with me last week. Now he's preaching at me. So, and if he feels that way and goes and uh, criticizing him, you know, if you have something to tell me, why don't you just tell me person to person? Why do you have to go up to the pulpit and try to say everything? And he would say, oh, no, 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 I wasn't talking to you. He cannot explain to him because this person already made up his mind. So what could be a more neutral way of saying? saying you, know, you, you just need to go in and ask, you know. Oh, Pastor, I, I don't know what it is. I just feel like you're just talking to me from there. Were you doing that? At least be open and make an open communication. A lot of pastors get a lot of accusation about that. And a lot of elders too, right? All of this uh, schema projection. Okay, your partner went out and when he received, uh, yeah, when your partner went out when he received the phone call and he came back in a few minutes. And if somebody always deceives you behind, what are you going to be thinking? What is he hiding from me? What is that thing about? You just think that he's hiding something, something bad, right? And the schema glasses on would be, who was that about? Another deception? What is it this time? He may have gone out. So you don't have to hear that his stressful thing happening at work, that he doesn't want you to get stressed out about. He just wants to handle all by himself. Could be that. He may have gone out, try to plan something surprise for you next week. Could be that. But your interpretation is about him trying to hide something from you. Then you become angry. So what would be open communication? Okay, without having schema glasses on, take off the schema glasses. Okay, try to read it, read out loud. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, you're reading like an elementary school kid, but it's the gesture, right? And I, I wrote like that, too. But just have a neutral, open, oh, why did you have to go out? Was it anything bad? If you said, no, it was nothing bad, then you don't want to ask anymore. Was it anything bad? Oh, it's just a lot of stress at work. You can say, do you want to talk about it? He may say, no, I don't want to talk about it. When my man says, I don't want to talk about it, you don't pursue. We don't know, we women, because we get all this stress by talking and talking and talking, we think if we can make a man to talk about it, he will be all de-stressed about everything. It doesn't work that way. For guys, talking about it is a stress. So if he says he doesn't want to talk about it, we leave them alone. And I didn't know this before. So when he said, oh, I don't want to talk about it, yes, you do. After you talk about it, you will feel so much better. He gets so frustrated. I don't feel better by talking about it. What he needs to have a good comfort hug, kiss on the cheek, and a lot of loving uh, confirmation on the forehead. 
at night time having good sexual uh, interaction. That's what makes him feel distressed about everything. And I didn't know about that. So now I became wise, right? When he said, I don't want to talk about it, I don't pursue. I don't demand him to talk about it. So one thing that we need to learn, right? So, you know, open communication. And that is what we call take off schema glasses. They don't read people's mind. Another one, your husband came home late. You are a victim of your parental affair and your past relational partner's affair. And your schema glasses reaction would be, who was the woman you were with all evening? Don't deny it. I already know by my gut feeling. So whenever you feel this gut feeling, you have to watch out. Okay? Don't trust your gut feeling. So what would be open communication? Okay, everyone, ready and go. Yeah, three nights in a row is a concern, right? So you do want to talk about this. And you can also say your feeling too, as long as you say, I feel this way when you don't come home three nights in a row. Now, is, this is a serious problem. It could be something very serious, but we don't know. So you just have open communication like that. Okay, number two, rules. Always use I statement when you express yourself. It's never, you made me feel this way. Because he does not make me feel that way. I feel this way because my own interpretation I made out of what I heard or what I saw. So it is never about you made me this way. I felt this way or I feel this way when I heard you this and when I saw you this, I felt this way. Always stay with the I statement. This is a very, very important, right? So what's the pain inside of you? Recognize your pain. And if you feel rejected or feel sad and feel upset, feel abandoned, try to find that feeling that I talked about this morning so that you are able to talk about, I felt this way when I heard you or when I saw you turning around. You know, whatever that you're experiencing at that time, stay with I feel. When I heard you, when I saw you, it's not what you did to me, what you said to me. It's our own interpretation gets our emotion going. Okay, so you know, pause to feel what you're feeling and label your primary feeling underneath that anger and start the first word of your sentence with I. Okay, you became angry because he didn't even look at you when you try to talk to him. So there could be 100,000 different interpretations out of the situation that he didn't look at you when you try to talk to him. But sometimes you message come out this way. You always make me angry because you never want to talk to me. You never want to talk to me. Who said I don't want to ever want, I, I never want to talk to you? Well, that's what you're doing right. Yes, men, remember, when your wife talks to you, you cannot look up ceiling. You cannot look at TV. You cannot look at the side. She needs to have an eye contact. That's when she feels that you're talking to her. So make sure you look at her. But as long as you don't accuse your spouse, your husband, that you don't want to talk to me, he will be able to remember what he heard today, right? Say, oh yeah, remember, oh yeah, I need to look at you, I'm sorry. He, look, you know, he will look at you. And if you do this several times, then now after you do it several times and over several months, then it's an automatic that your brain gets trained when your wives talk to you, your head turns automatically. And look at her. <gasps> Somebody's having really fun there. <laughs> Do you want to share? <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, so there is 10% of women who has a little bit more of a male brain. But don't worry, if you have a little bit more of the male part of the brain, you will always meet a guy who has a little bit more of the female brain. It just works that way. 
you know. Mm -hmm. So don't worry. You don't ever match with somebody with the same uh, traits. Yeah. So the, that's okay. Yes. You know, like if a guy talks a lot, the girl usually don't talk. That's the case with my first daughter. My daughter is just like her dad. She doesn't talk a lot. But my son-in-law, he talks a lot. So when he comes to our house, we talk. She sleeps. <laughs> and one time they came, and my son-in-law's father came to our house. So he was complaining about Anita not talking to him. And then his father said, Ray, you talk five to ten times more than her. Why does she have to talk? You talk all the time. She, she doesn't get any chance to talk. So, you know, he has a little bit of this uh, female part that he always complains about her not talking. She said, I'm listening. But I look at her. She's not listening. She's doing this and, and I'm not looking at him. And she, he wants her to look at him. So, they, you know, we get matched like that. Okay. Okay. So, you asked your husband to pick up some milk and cereal, but he completely forgot about it. The you message would be, you never care about me or what I need, right? And if you do, you would at least remember what I asked you to do for me. So then men get so frustrated. Just me forgetting about things. Why does it get equated to the level of love I have for you, right? Level of care. So the I message would be pause to feel what you're feeling, label your feeling, and start saying with the I. Okay? So ready and go. And read out loud because this is the first practice. Okay? Ready and go. Mm -hmm. If your wife asks you this way, would you be able to remember? Try to remember at least. So here we go. Another men and women differences that I didn't get to talk about in men and women differences. Men's brain is very compartmentalized, right? So one side of the brain, they uh, store all about the vacation thing. This side of the brain is all about the work. And this side of brain is all about the a trip that he needs to go tomorrow for business. And then all of these things are compartmentalized. They uh, reserve it and save it that way. For woman's brain, everything is connected and globally. So if we think about if my mother's birthday is coming in a couple weeks, I think about that all the time. What am I going to buy? What, what, in what restaurant am I going to go? And in all of this, we don't ever forget about it. For men's brain, the anniversary is coming two weeks. And it happens to be the two days before the business gets so busy and a lot of conflicts there. Then on an anniversary day, he comes in with nothing. Just walk in like a naive little boy. And then wife is just waiting. Today is our anniversary. Oh my goodness, I forgot about it. It's because you don't care for me. We interpret it that way. But it's because men's brain is so compartmentalized when they are preoccupied with something, they can easily forget about something. So don't get so offended or so hurt by them not remembering. So, you know, it, it, it can happen. They will forget sometimes. But if you say nicely, so please remember next time. And now, you know, we have a cell phone. When you want him to buy something and bring home, you talk to him, and right after that, you send a text message. Milk, orange, whatever you need, because if he remember two things, the third one he's not going to remember. He won. So if there's more than two things, you need to write everything, right? Everything down, and then he will remember to buy. And then, man, if you are very forgetful, use your alarm system on your iPhone, there is no excuse for you to forget now. So do it and remember and do it, okay? Your eyes are following a pretty woman. Talked about this. Guys are very visual. When there's a pretty woman walking, they don't know they're walking that woman. Looking at that woman, they just go like this. They're lost. <laughs> like this, right? And then you miss it. They look at you now. That's all you care about. You can go live with that woman. Don't do it. 
I told you, when you do that, what can happen? That can really happen. Something? The cable. Oh, be careful on this. Thank you. Okay. The what would be the I message? Find your feeling and start with I. Okay? Ready and go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when I do this, and some woman will say, not just when in front of me, all the time. Forget about all the time. They cannot do it. So just ask them to be polite to you when he is with you, right? And if he tries hard, that's good. If he still forgets to try, then you distract him like how I told you to distract, right? So, you know, things like that. Just don't put your schema glasses on interpreting your husband's behavior. Okay. When dealing with intense emotions, lots of colors there, right? Do not minimize your partner's feeling when you're dealing with his or her emotions. Maximize the importance of partner's feeling. This is not really hard once you know what I'm talking about. So minimizing, meaning reducing the degree of your partner's feeling to nothing. Oh, don't get upset about that. That's such a little trivial thing. That's the minimizing. Right? Do not respond as if his or her feeling is nothing. For that little thing, for nothing, for small things like that, none of these sentence fragments can be allowed in your couple's talk. Every feeling that your spouse feels is important. It's a very, very important to her, important to him. They feel the way because of their own background. So whatever is important to me may not be important to him. But what's important to him, I'm thinking, why does he get upset over that? But the significance of the important level comes from our own family background. If I didn't get enough love, and when I feel that I don't get enough love, then I, my emotion is very, very important. So don't make any feeling small or little or nothing. Validate and re reinforce your partner's feeling, always, right? So minimizing, your wife is crying. Minimizing would be, you're crying again? You cry for every little thing on this earth. I hate when a grown-up woman cries. That's a severe minimization, right? And when you talk like this, no woman will stay next to you. You cannot talk like that. So what is maximizing? Okay, everybody ready and go. Yeah. So that's maximizing, validating, supporting your partner's feeling. So whatever your partner feels, that feeling is a very, very important to her and to you. So you want to maximize no matter what that you're going to maximize that feeling. Your husband couldn't sleep last night, he said. The minimizing would be, what's wrong with you? Why do you always let little things get to you like that? Just let go. What a minimization. Is he going to sleep better tonight? No, he's so upset by feeling not being understood by you. So he's going to have a sleep last night again. So what's the maximizing? Everyone, ready and go. Oh, no. He must have been bothered by something very important. What can I do for him to sleep? Yeah. The husbands, you think that will make you feel better? When he said, oh, wow. If you can't sleep like that, that must be a very, very important thing for you. Would that make you feel better and sleep a little bit better tonight? Supporting and validating. You don't ever make any feeling less than what he or she is feeling. Okay? Your husband became very, very angry about something. The minimizing again. Angry again. I don't know if there's anything that doesn't make you angry. You get angry over every little thing. It happens on a drive. He gets angry. And the wife says, oh, you get angry about everybody going like this. Don't do that. 
I'm so tired of it. That's a lot of minimization. So what is maximizing? Ready and go. Yeah. So while you're driving, that he honks at somebody's car, the driver, and then you know that it was your husband's fault anyway. But if he does that, and then you just go, yeah, honk at him twice. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. Okay? So don't try to defend somebody you don't even know. And then you get into argument by doing that. So always be on your spouse's side. Okay? That's the number rule four. The side with your partner in all situations, no matter what. So no matter what is the key. Okay. Three taboos in communication. Do not side with a third person who's not even present at that moment. We're so stupid sometimes. We don't even know this person. We're defending them. So we are arguing about it, right? Okay. So don't be a judge. Don't try to make it clear what and who is right or wrong. Okay? And don't be a teacher. Don't try to teach your partner. Okay? Just be a side person. You side with your partner all the time. So there we go. Another example. Jean, you know my partner Jimmy, right? You would believe how selfish he is. He makes time off every afternoon, and he doesn't even tell me where he's going. He expects me to handle everything all by myself. I don't know if I can handle this much longer. The siding with the Jimmy would be something like this. I'm sure he has some good reason about what he's doing. Just be a man and be patient. He will come around and do his own thing. Would that make your, partner, uh, your husband feel good? Men? No. You side with your husband. Okay? All women. Read. Go. Do you want me to go and talk to him? And he will say, oh, no, 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 just, I'm just venting out. I just need to vent. That's all he needs. So you side with your partner no matter what. Whether he's talking about your mom. Is that a big one? Let me see if that's the example next one. Oh, that is. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Jason, I want to talk about your mom. I don't think she really likes me much. Whenever I go to her house, she seems to only focus on what I'm, not doing, what I'm doing wrong. And it's really hard for me. It's really hard for me to face your mom sometimes. Siding with your mom, men, would be something like, I don't want you to talk about my mom like that. You must be doing something wrong for her to say like that. She's never like that with me. Just listen to her and do what she says. Of course, your mom is never like that to you. She's only like that to your wife. Guys, remember. And she will do more when you're not there. So when you talk like this, she not only hates more of your ma, now she's hating you. Because she feels like, yeah, the woman said here. <laughs> right? So then how do you side in a situation like this? Okay? Ready? And go. All guys only. Ready? And go. And most of the times, the, your wife will say, no, 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 don't talk to her. I will handle. But she just needs to vent it out. So whenever your wives talk about your mom, you're going to be on her side. And make sure, wife, when you complain about his mom, you come home and do it. So he doesn't get stuck between you and his mom, right? So, you know, you talk to him, and her husband will always go, oh, my goodness, why is my mom doing that? I thought she was such a wise woman, but she's not. I don't know. I will go talk to her now. It bothers me. And she'll say, oh, no, no, don't, 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 don't do it. And then you just don't do it. But you made her feel really, really good, and you're connecting with her. She, you made her feel that you are on her side. All right? Very simple wisdom. 
Okay, rule number five. Just summarize the content and the feeling of your partner's conversation when an intense emotion is involved. Do not give solution. Men, it may be hard to believe, we know as much solution as you know about just about everything. So when there's a problem, just to listen and summarize and don't try to give solution. You always get in trouble because you're trying to give solution. So remember and keep in your brain, don't give solution. Just summarize what she says, and then you empathize with that person, with your partner. Okay? So, Jay, I don't think our head elder likes me at all. Whenever I see him, he ignores me. Even when I try to say hi to him, he turns away from me. Giving solution would be, no, you're thinking wrong. He's not, like, he's not that kind of guy. He was probably too busy. Next time, go talk to him and ask him why, if you would really feel like that, if you really feel like that. So that's like a disagreeing and giving solution. So then what is summarizing? Okay, plain summarization. Okay, all of you ready? And go. Yeah, that's all you can do. But you just by and you say, wow, he really makes you feel that he ignores you. That is not a good feeling. That's an empathy part. The first part is the summary, right? So you can use this summary, summarization, with any communication with church members if you are the leader too. So when somebody comes and talks to you and talk about somebody else, all you want to do is summarize and just listen. You don't want to try to defend that third person who's not there, or you don't want to give solution to that person. So you just summarize and listen and summarize and listen. You don't have to have an answer. Because by the time you try to defend the other person, that this person will get upset more because she or he doesn't feel that he's being listened. She's being listened, right? So do summarize and just, oh, sorry, you're feeling like this. Okay? So that's a summarization. This part takes a little bit of practice. Okay? Summarizing. Jenna, I am really stressed about the business. It's not getting better. I don't know if I can continue this much longer. So giving solution would be, I told you to fold that business a long time ago. Do something else. Don't tell me about your stress. That's a disconnecting, right? So what would be summarization? Okay, ready and go. Mm -hmm. So summarize first, and you're willing to listen. And if he wants to talk about it, he can. And if he says, no, I don't want to talk about it right now, don't go after him. Say, so, okay, whenever you're ready, I'll be ready for you. Okay? So that's the summarization. Whenever there's an intense emotion coming, you just immediate thing you're going to think about is, oh, I need to summarize what she's going to say or what he's going to say. Okay? Number six, this is the last one, SSP solution. When you made him or her upset, when you made a mistake and your spouse is upset, you do SSP. S, summarize. S, say sorry. And then connect the next sentence with and, not with but. So a lot of people say, I'm sorry to hear I did this and this to you, but... And then that all the whatever you say, sorry, disappears up in the air, right? So you don't ever want to make a connection word with the but. You always say, you know, oh, uh, you're saying that you are really upset with me because of what I did this and that. I'm so sorry. And, right? Not but. And. And then you say whatever you need to explain. And the last P is you promise you will not do that again. 
If this is something you did made your spouse upset, you want to promise. Being able to say sorry takes a lot of knowledge to say sorry. Some men, it's a very, very difficult to say sorry. They think that saying sorry becoming a loser. In relationship, being able to say sorry, you become winner. Because it heals. A lot of healing happens by hearing sorry. So S S P solution. Try to memorize this. Okay? So you don't listen when I talk to you. You forgot to take out the trash again. So what would be the SSP? S summarization. Everybody read. Yeah, so it's S-S-P. Summarize, say sorry, and promise you will correct your behavior. Is that one easy to remember? S-S-P, summarize, say sorry, and then you will change it next time. Okay, what's keeping you so busy? It seems like I am the last person you care for. So, S-S-P, S. So that's SSP. This when you made a mistake, when you, you made your partner feel upset, sad, angry, resentful, you're going to use SSP. You don't want to try to explain yourself when your partner is upset. Just do simple SSP. SSP. Okay. When I said hi to you, you just walked away. That didn't make me feel good. Summarize. Mm -hmm. And this happens a lot in the church too. You know, some of us, we come in with a very lonely heart. We want people's attention. And somebody tried to greet to you and you didn't even see and that person gets really, really hurt. And you're lucky if that person comes to talk to you, right? You know, Jenny, I try to talk, I try to say hi to you. You just walked away from me. And then you don't want to try to explain, oh, I, it's because I was so busy and I need to prepare for Sabbath school and this and that, and you're already making her feel lonely again, right? So you summarize quickly. Oh, my goodness, you're so upset because I didn't see you when you tried to say hi to me. I'm so sorry I made you feel that way. You're just saying sorry because she is feeling that way, right? And the next time when I come to church, I will try to look her up more. Today I was a little too preoccupied with the things I had to do. But I know that recognizing you is a very, very important thing. So I will do my best. So just do SSP. And you, that way you keep a lot of members stay here. So when you talk, oh, you know when you come to church, you're not the only person that I have to greet. There are about 200 people coming here. And the rejection feeling triples, right? Will that person come back again next week? That's not going to happen. So when someone comes to you about what you did hurt them, you do SSP. Summarize what that person say. Say sorry. And you will do what? Try to pre uh, promise that you will try not to do that again. Some things you cannot promise if it's somebody else, right? And there's some things you can promise that you can say, I can try. But if there's some things that you can promise that you can pr promise, but to your spouse, you will always promise no matter what. Because if she's not happy, if he's not happy, nothing is happy on the third. You know how important the marriage quality is. When marriage is not happy, nothing is happy, no matter how successful you are outside. So learning to keep the marriage happy is the most important thing. And we all make a mistake. We're so capable of hurting each other. So when your spouse tells you she or he got hurt, you do SSP right away. Summarize. Say sorry 
and promise. Okay? So extra tips to remember in couples talk. Look at each other face to face. All the time. Okay? Never eye rolling while you're talking to your partner. Oh, I, I cannot believe this. You don't ever eye roll to your kid or to your partner. If you have that habit, get rid of it today, now. It's a very, very destructive pattern. Okay? Sneering. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Don't do that. You just don't do it. You just drop it. This thing, you don't try. You just don't do it. Right now, you drop it, okay? And, you know, shaking your head from side to side. Oh, I cannot believe what he's talking about. So these are the things that you don't ever do at home. Don't shake your head while your spouse is talking, okay? No walking away while your spouse is talking to you. No walking away unless you made an agreement. I need a time out. Can I take a time out? If he or she said, okay, then you walk away. You don't walk away in the middle of talking. Bad habit. Very, very hurtful behavior. Okay? No screaming, throwing things, absolutely no hitting. No hitting. If you happen to throw things and hit your partner, you need to be in therapy right away. So you don't hurt your kid and you don't hurt your partner. That is not triggered by your partner. Something else got triggered when you are throwing things and hitting and doing that. It's not about your partner right that moment. There's some other pain got triggered that you need to be healed from. Okay? So remember, no eye rolling, no sneering, no sarcasm, no clicking. <laughs> Don't do it. Okay? No shaking your head from side to side. No walking away. No screaming. No throwing. No hitting. So those are the rules that I made. There are a few more, but uh, six would be good enough for this uh, presentation. So from the beginning, what was the first rule? Take off your schema glasses. Yeah. What was the second rule? I message. What was the third rule? No minimizing. What was the fourth one? Side with your partner no matter what. What's the fifth one? Mm -hmm. Summarize. Be able to summarize content and the feeling. Good. And the sixth is what? SSP, because when you made a mistake, it's an emergency. There's an emergency siren going. When she's mad at you for what you did, you just have to get ready to be able to do SSP. That's not the time to defend. And that's the time that when you know that you're capable of hurting your partner without your intention, when your partner said she or he got hurt, you do, I surrender to you. I say, I'm sorry, I made you feel this way, I will try to change. That's when you really know that you're serving to God to become like Him, or you're serving yourself to defend yourself. So that's when you know that when you get attacked, that you'll be able to empathize, summarize, and say, I'm sorry, and being able to say, I will try to change. That's being a compassionate partner. Okay? So let's try to read this together. Okay? Ready and go. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the heart of men. He does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is a fruit bearing. The reproduction of Christ's character in the believer that it may be reproduced in others. There are two regions who are still living on this earth. One, there are some people who don't know Jesus yet, that they need to hear the gospel. Second, God is waiting for us to become more like him. So when we go to heaven, step on that golden gate, 
that we feel comfortable in being in heaven. Not that he is trying to qualify us, us becoming more righteous. We will never be good enough, no matter how hard we try, that we will be good enough to go to heaven. We go to heaven because he gave us free. The heaven is given. He covered us with his righteousness. We become white in his God's eyes. But we try this so that we will be shining his face, his image to the people so more people will know about God, Jesus Christ, that he and three gods are waiting for us to come there. So when we are trying to be a compassionate partner, we are evangelizing the world. This is the only way that I think that it's going to work. That we cannot act like a non-Christian like at home and act like a Christian like at church and think that we will be spreading the gospel of love. That's not going to happen. So when we focus on becoming more like him, talking more like him, behaving more like him, empathizing with our partner more like him, that's when heaven will be established, I think. Okay? So I hope some of the information I share with you, not enough, but the little bit of what you heard over this weekend will help you to make your home more loving and become more happier in your marriage. And therefore, you create a happy environment at home and that your kids will grow up in healthy ways and it will be easier for them to become and act more like a Christ than how we try so hard. Okay.